Welcome to the Archive. In today's discourse episode, Connor and I have an absolute blast talking about all sorts of things. We talk about gun control, HR 127 specifically, mm -hmm. which is a new initiative of gun control. We talk about tyrannical governments, government overreach. We talk a little bit about the nature of sovereignty as an individual mm -hmm. and what it means to be an individual in a social construction or a group of people. We talk a bit about Freemasonic symbolism and how that relates to individuals versus collectives and those who are in power as elites versus those who are under their thumb. We also talk a little bit about the Nietzschean idea of the Ubermensch and how to become the Ubermensch. We also talk a little bit about the ability to protect yourself versus protecting others. Yep. And we just go all across the board on gun control and philosophy. And while we didn't necessarily flesh out every one of these arguments to their complete ends, we definitely had fun, and I think that you'll learn a lot and at least enjoy it as much as we did while we were discussing mm -hmm. it. This will not be the last episode of this kind. So many of these things that we bring up in this episode are hyperlinked to other episodes that we've done, and we will only continue this line of discourse with each other as we talk more and more about how to become better people, how to educate ourselves, and how to just change the world one step at a time as we also work even harder to change ourselves first. So with that, thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Let's jump in. So a lot's going on. Uh, we have a new president, new legislation, new executive orders. That brings up this idea of institutions kind of tightening their grip. And one thing that's come up organically in our personal conversations is this idea of, of gun control. Yeah. And more particularly, this specific bill that is hr 124 127 or 127 thank you and just going over it it seems to me like it's probably the most radical gun control bill that's ever been put forth as far as all the grounds that it covers yeah, and everything it does everything it's gonna enact yeah and by the way i just want to say too that there was a point where this bill was being talked about and the text wasn't available and it was only, I think, in the last like two weeks where the actual text, which delineated everything, the specifics of the bill, came came to came the to public light. eye. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna just read a little bit here. There's a there's sure, a lot yeah. going on. Please so do. the first thing that's crazy about it, every single gun totally registered. Mm -hmm. Every gun, like it doesn't matter if you already own the gun, the firearm, you have to register it. it like it's. It, it, does that include shotguns? Everything. Everything. Every every firearm has to be registered. Got it. You also have to talk about where it's stored in your home. Right. Which is insane to well, me. Well, not only that, but it's to make it worse is that you have to put it where it's stored, but also that's public record. It's public record. So that's like a you know a blueprint for criminals yeah. to be able to know exactly where they need to go in your house to disarm mm -hmm. you so they can rob no, you. No, exactly. Or, or to you. do whatever. Right. A lot of people might claim slippery slope. Oh, that's a slippery slope fallacy. Like, how are you getting to that conclusion from this premise over here? We ask you to register your guns and to make it public knowledge. How are you extrapolating from that an outcome in which a criminal is going to come disarm you? I mean, it's pretty much common sense. Right. That, that, to me, that's not a slippery slope. That's yeah. just me putting myself in the mind of a criminal and thinking, hey, if that guy has something that I want and, mm -hmm. I, and I really want it that bad, yeah. the first thing I'm going to think about is, okay, where are his guns at? And you also can know whether or not people even own guns. Right, because if a person's a, right. uh, like a criminal, maybe, and that's a huge problem too that we don't have to get too deep into. But if you committed a crime and you're a felon from 10, 20 years ago, depending on the state you're in, you can never uh, expunge your record, and you'll never be able to buy a firearm and protect your family or yourself, and and exercise your Second Amendment right ever because you were a criminal at one point in your life. Right, kind of shouts back out to the like the cancel culture episode that we did, in which like, is there ever a road to redemption? Should you ever be you right. know, able to to speak on a platform? Should you ever be able to hold a gun in your home again? Well, people will now know whether or not you have a gun, whether or not you're a criminal or otherwise. Maybe you're just afraid of guns or you're, you're not trained and you're, you have small children and you don't want them to accidentally shoot themselves or whatever the reason might be that you don't like guns. People will now know that you don't have guns in your house because it will be a federal mandate, a law, that you actually have to register these firearms and they will be public record. Right. So if you don't. So not only can I know where the guns are in your house, but I can probably go to some website that's going to emerge inevitably that'll tell you, hey, this is your neighbor and he has multiple guns. And yeah. there's a few blue dots, kind of yep. like a. Kind of like the, the a pedo pedophile. Tracker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's good to have things registered like sure. that, but then at the same time, there, there's some, there's some questions here. Yeah. Like, we're in Idaho. Like, I could literally go online to ziidaho.com 
which is a, like a Craigslist mm -hmm. for guns. And I could sell someone a gun and they don't have to register it with anybody. They don't yeah. have to tell any agency. I just, I can sell you a gun. I don't have to do a background check on you or anything. Yeah. So we're, we're coming from a place that's pretty radically right. Right. It's, va it's yeah. radically right. I mean, Idaho's gun laws are pretty lax. If you're not a convicted felon and you can legally own that firearm that you have, you can concealed carry without a permit anywhere in the state. Unless you're in Boise. Yeah, except for like within very specific city limits and uh, of course in government buildings and hospitals and stuff like that. But because that's up to the policy of that right. of that building and whatnot and that, that facility. But honestly, uh, anybody who's not a convicted felon can go purchase a firearm if you're legally yeah. able to. And own I also it. don't if I'm selling you a firearm, it's not I don't it's not my responsibility to check whether you're a felon. That's on right, you. Right, right. So if I wanted to walk around with uh, like a loaded pistol tucked under my arm in a vest or something, I could totally do that legally in Idaho without a permit. Right. But the permits, people get them so they can travel over state lines and not run into problems. Exactly. But that's where we live. We have we have signs at the airport that say don't bring guns on the plane as if you have actually have to let people know. <laughs> yeah. That's a thing. Another crazy thing is, t I mean, this will be a taxpayer purchase thing. I mean, there's going to be background checks. So there will be two background checks. The first is when you actually purchase the firearm, but sure. then you have to get a license to own the firearm Which as costs well. a ton of money. Yeah, which you'll have to do a second background check for, which is a little asinine. Yeah. Well, you also have to, the, for, for the license, you have to do it every year for the first five years and then every three years after that. Right. So that's the taking away time out of your life. It's like 24-hour class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to do a class. You have to pass a class, pay for the class. You also have to get insured to own the firearm. Literally, you have to pay for insurance. I think it's said something upwards around like $800 a year that right. has to be renewed every year, which is absolutely crazy to me. Like, I understand that. But at the same time, it's just not to get too deep into the like the political aspect of this sure. conversation. We want to keep it more philosophical, but we just want to give the audience just you well, know the, the, the my question the bottom line. would be where how does how does me paying money help anybody because i own a firearm like where is that money being allocated is it, like is well it, it's going to go to the pay, the payment of the classes it's going to go to pay the instructors to open the facilities probably mm. to keep those bills paid it's probably going to also go to the psych evaluator so you also have to get a psych evaluation yes and so it's going to go to those people and pay them which by the way i don't think is an outlandish thing like you should make sure that you're in a proper mental state to, before right. you own a, something that could literally take lives but the problem with the psych evaluation is it literally says in the bill that if you came in with depression or, or if you, like if you ever checked yourself in for psychosis or, or depression because you're having a or like a bad day and you're like suicidal or whatever and you're just having a, that strong attack and you just want to make sure that you're okay and you check yourself into a hospital kiss your gun rights goodbye like right. goodbye well and another another one too that they said was that if you're addicted to a substance or alcohol and that's another a weird one because another real slippery slope well how do you determine like what if i have two beers on friday every friday well they're gonna say well connor has eight beers a month so he's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. That's a huge philosophical question for sure. Is like who is going to make these decisions? Of course, the legislators. And and are they going to be acceptable? One of the huge takeaway points from this is that in the bill, the the psych evaluation will be approved by and sort of disseminated by the attorney general. His name is Mark Garland. He does have a weird relationship. He has There's a weird a relationship to gun laws. I, I can't mm. remember the specifics of it, but he's definitely been a proponent against. Um, well, the story the is free that, exchange of guns. Yeah, like he he very much is against people even ho having guns in their homes. Sure. Like literally even having guns in your home. So it'll probably far-reaching assumption here probably will end up making it extremely difficult to pass a psyche bill, right. honestly. But who knows? I mean, that's just me espousing my negative opinion, <laughs> my, my pessimism here. But who knows for sure. But the craziest thing is that if you have a semi-automatic rifle, one that goes pew pew kind of quickly, but not as quickly as an automatic rifle, you have to get a separate license for that. Mm. So that's even more money. And if your magazine holds more than 10 rounds, which most semi-automatic weapons do. I mean, even the even the two handguns that I have here at home both have magazines that are 16 rounds. So those magazines would technically be illegal because pistols are semi-automatic most of the time. Most people don't realize that. They just think like big gun go pew pew looks scary, semi-auto. Right. They hear that and they're like, oh, an assault rifle. And then it's like, let's get rid of that assault rifle. But even your handgun can go pew pew that fast. Right. So really it's kind of crazy right but uh but yeah so that's the that's the gist of the whole bill i mean there there are some other caveats in there some some details that we may have missed but the weird part for me was that part of the psych evaluation includes an interview of your ex-spouses i i heard that i heard that i don't know what that's all about i didn't read that deep into the bill yet myself to to confirm that but i heard that as part of the psych eval you 
the character witnesses who can be called upon by the evaluators yes. can include ex-spouses. So, I mean, I don't know if that was somebody making like a hyperbolic sort of argument against that, just pick cherry picking one particular aspect of, of life. And, but because when you go to court for child support or whatever, you're always going to be talking against character witnesses who are going to be against you. Right. Like you're, you know, potentially like your ex-wife. But no whatever. divorce is a happy experience. So, mm -hmm. like, literally, if I had resentment towards my ex-spouse right. and she was applying for a gun and they called me, I could just be like, yeah, fuck that bitch. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, also, that's why there's so much I'm other... I'm going to say that she's the worst, most unhealthy-minded person ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why there's a whole lot of extra deliberation in the courts and why you have to have multiple meetings with the judge and there have to be other character witnesses, sure. which almost makes me wonder, like, why would you even include that in this bill to begin with? Because then there's going to be extra deliberation, extra character witnesses, extra work that's going to have to go into it, which is going to cost more money, so more taxpayer money. So, I mean, I get it. Everybody wants safety and protection. And right. with that comes well. That's what I was the, the metaphor that I was trying to you know. I don't want to make a false equivalency, but I was thinking like, okay, if you're a if you if you drive semi trucks, you have to get a CDL mm -hmm. and you have to renew it frequently mm -hmm. because well, and quite frankly, because you could potentially kill well, people, and quite frankly, way more people die from car accidents than so much more than gun than violence guns. or so, or gun or gun accidents even. So it's more understandable, but at the same time, like I, I can understand like yes, if you own a gun. Maybe every year there's some new gun safety procedures that weren't known about the previous year, and you should yeah. know about those things. Mm -hmm. So I, on one hand, I understand that. Um, on the other hand, it's like what, a lot of these people a, – a lot of people who own guns aren't like CDL drivers where they make lots of money. Right. So they don't – not only do they not have the time – to carve out to take that class, but mm -hmm. they don't have the money to put. Well, it's not a, it's not like a full time job that you're doing. You're right. Like you're not like spending all your time and all of your. You, it's not something that you're earning money off of. Right. Usually, it's like a it's it's a it's a Second Amendment right slash hobby slash thing that citizens should just be able to do. Right. Per the amendment, or sorry, per the Second Amendment, um, doing something like driving a commercial vehicle is something that you're doing for your actual livelihood right in which you will make money so it makes sense that you can use some of that money to pay back the fees that it took for you to get there as in you would do for something like a college class sure. to get a degree to get a job right. it's very similar so i feel like there's some there's some wiggle room to say that they're not quite equivalent to each other but that's just the gist of the whole bill right i just right. wanted to give the details of it instead of necessarily getting to the minutia of the bipartisan politics that is pretty much the bill right so that can that takes me. In, oh, the last thing you also uh, I think the bill extends the age of owning a firearm to twenty one. Right. So that that can kind of segues into what I want to talk about. So you about. can get married at eighteen. You can have a family, but you don't have the right to protect your family. Right. If needed. And you can go to war. You can join up to the army at eighteen. Right. But you can't own a personal weapon in your home. I wonder if it'll allow army members to have, you know, army personnel to have firearms in mm. their home, or maybe it'll just be all twenty one. And if you're eighteen in the army, sorry, you can only use a firearm if you're like on the battlefield or in tr training and then one of the NCOs or something is going to have to come take They're the firearm from you. They're going to give you like dual-wielded knives? Yeah, or something. <laughs> they'll, or they'll give you like a fake gun and be like, yeah. here, shoot blanks with this. It's not real, so you're not going to go to jail, kid. Like, I don't even get it. I don't understand. Right. It, it, that's the biggest, that's the first thing I really wanted to talk about before we kind of got lost talking about all the details. Um, the question is like, there's seemingly this social movement, as far as I can see, that is both purposeful and also just a symptom of our economic crises in which the age of becoming an adult is getting and being pushed further and further and further down the timeline mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, we in the West, we don't have a certain powerful culture where we have coming to age ceremonies like a quinceanera right. or, or like a bat mitzvah or something. We don't have anything like that. We don't go out and hunt and capture the caribou and bring it home and feed all of our family. We don't mask up and fight the demon in our village where the villagers are pretending to be the demon that we've been afraid of for our entire lives and we conquer it and become men. There's no ritual like that for us to become adults other than perhaps maybe prom, maybe, and homecoming, maybe. That's all that I can really think of in the West. And that being graduation. said, maybe graduation, perhaps. Yeah, sure, graduation which isn't that great of a ceremony yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like that in and of itself is one of the problems that I see. But there's a bunch of other things going on too, right? There's like financial problems. It's hard for kids just out of high school to get jobs that are paying well, so they have to go to college. Most of the time, those, ca those kids who are going to college get out of college and then have a really hard time finding a job for this reason or that reason. Now, I, like not, yeah, maybe now. not always, but now for sure. And even those kids who do end up doing really well and just sort of like, going and hitting all the, the marks and the margins to make 
the ends meet, I suppose, even then, the, the jobs aren't necessarily competitive and paying well enough wages to keep up with the, the constant inflation and sign of the times of, of the change of the economic crises, such that even those kids who graduate with amazing degrees and they're in, doing well in their fields, oftentimes have to stay with their parents. And all of these things combined, yeah. they're like pushing the envelope, pushing the timeline back a little bit. And it's almost like demasculinating the men. And and it, th there's like, I don't want to get too deep into or, like the feminism Or at feminism least babying chat. the people, you know? Like, well, I mean, I can approach right. that from many angles. Human beings as animals have a long incubation period. Mm, we have indeed. to be cared for for a long time before we can be set free into oh, the world. I know. I have a one-year-old. <laughs> exactly. You know more yeah. than I do. <laughs> But it seems to me that that time is being pushed out more and more. And I'm not, and by the way, I just want to say I'm not a victim, but it's very clear that millennials don't have the stake, a stake in the economy the same way that our parents did. Right. Probably because well, we're not do? as mature as, as, as they were at that time because they mm. were hungry. They, they grew up in poverty. They had to work hard. We had all yeah. the, most of what we have passed down to us. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, on one hand, yeah, pushing the level of adultness to 21 makes sense. But to me, it's like the education system tried to do this. They said, okay, well, well, people are getting worse test scores. So what we'll do is we'll raise the standard of test scores so that they have to work harder to, to, to right. get there. Mm -hmm. And it produced the opposite result. Right. If, you, if you tell people you're not an adult till you're 21, all you're going to do is exacerbate is, that childness. Right. Prolong it. Child Pro the yeah. childhood, yeah, childhood, the childhood, childness, that childness. I mean, child likeness, <laughs> yeah, there you go, <laughs> for sure. Um, no, man, I, I really like that that point for sure. It's like you don't incentivize them becoming adults, so then, but how can we, right? There's so many uh, like accumulated, compounded problems that are creating this weird controversy, or I guess neurosis in our social in our social construct. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the things that gun control as an argument, especially something like HR 127, brings up to the forefront of my co my cognitive awareness is just, again, it's just another instance of saying you have to be 21 before you can behave as if you're an adult. You have to be 21 in some states now to buy alcohol, which is normal, or also to purchase tobacco products mm. or vape products. Right. And it's like everything is getting pushed that way, but we can still vote when we're 18. Like the, the innocent and... There have been pushes to lower it as well. Which is crazy. Yeah. The innocent and impressionable minds of young adult Americans who aren't quite adults yet, who have any semblance of an idea about the real world, because unfortunately they have to be, but they are still being coddled under the wing of their parents, or they have been struggling for so long in the gutters and just the underbelly of society that they don't necessarily know how to contribute properly to a functioning social construct either. Mm. So there's a lot of contention and there's a lot of pinching points where there's danger here in which you're telling people to be adults later in life. And especially with the voting thing, the whole voting thing. I was talking to my wife, Sierra, uh, about her ideas on this. And she always says that she feels as if the voting age doesn't necessarily need to be pushed one way or the other. It just boils down to if you're a taxpayer or not. Like if you're actually paying taxes, then you should be able to, um, you should then be that able means to make you decisions. Have a stake in you have a stake in the, the actual economy, social. Right. Yeah, exactly. And she, that the same I mean, of course, things are not as black and white like when you're talking about people's lives and people's life and death, but making decisions that could affect life and death, such as HR 127 bill getting passed, is being affected by uh, by young adults who are voting. So sh should we change the adult age even further? Should mm. we push it out further? Should we give people more time to mature and grow and experience their lives and, and, and engage in the hedonistic wantonness of the Western paradigm? Or should we keep like it's one of the biggest questions that i have see the thing is is like i understand as if you're a successful human being and you've had offspring i understand the desire to want to protect them from the same adversity that you had to face mm. but you have to wonder is the adversity that you faced the cause of you your success i mean what was it was it the problems right. and the plight that you dealt with that gave you the tools and the ability to decipher what is right and what's wrong to the point where you got where you are. I think that happens for a lot of people. I think that for other demographics, it does the opposite. And I think that a really? lot of a lot of these, yeah, um, sort of like minority groups, more the extremists with the loudest voices in the room, would tell you that that's the exact opposite of what occurs. That usually the people who are successful inherited their wealth or inherited their success. When you look at the statistics, and it's actually com completely the opposite. That's what the that's what I think the mainstream consensus is that people feel if you go out on the street and you ask that question to random people especially in metropolitan yeah. zones in, in, in large cities, especially whether it's left-leaning, people are going to say that's incorrect. So I don't have all the data in front of me, but I would wage that the, what 
the reason why that conception is prevalent is because what people are doing is taking statistics from the top 1%, which doesn't represent the majority of people, and projecting that onto everybody. I think that might only be true only in the upper echelon mm -hmm. of society, but for the most part, you know, you're, most most of the people in the world aren't getting a million dollars handed down to them. Exactly. So I, I disagree with that small, what I would consider small minority opinion. Yeah. For sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of problems in the world which are contributing to what why it seems as if human beings, especially in the West, are incapable of taking care of themselves. And it, 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 that, that's that, that's the whole idea again behind gun control. I think so much of it has is boiling down to the question not of how can we protect each other. That is one huge part of it. I think there's a lot of fear and fear mongering out there. But a huge aspect is how can we save ignorant, foolish individuals from damaging themselves and society at large? Like, how can we limit that? And rather than educating people, which I guess they're trying to do by forcing classes and things like this, so maybe I'm, I'm biting my own tongue here, eating my own words, but for the most part, across the board, when I'm looking at education in the West, it's like, we're not taught how to do taxes, we're not taught how to live a civil life, we're not taught how about legislation or really, like, government... Some schools are, morality. it depends, yeah, morality, how to become a good actual person. We're not taught about the liberal arts. We're not taught about how to like think critically in school. There's so much wrong with education that's adding on to this. And we will have more episodes where we talk specifically about the problems in uh, academia. But again, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's all this compounded interest, I guess, in the negative side of things in which it's all causing people to be adults later and later and later in life instead of in incentivizing them to become adults as early as possible. It's almost like, oh, let's coddle people and push it out as far as possible. Right. But it's like very hypocritical because in some ways they're doing that. Legis our legislators are doing that. And in other ways, they're not. So it's very much just like a weird right. question. I ask To an myself. extreme now. Like, I mean, literally college courses will put in breaks into their um lectures where they say hey you know we're going to be going over some pretty sensitive material so anybody who might have an aversion to that you may leave the room at this moment hmm. and it won't affect their grade really just yeah. like trigger warning that's a trigger warning i didn't want to say the word but that's what it is oh, okay yeah. yeah might be uh too too hyper politicized to yeah. use the term the, the algorithms are just going <laughs> to cut it right there that's kind of funny i mean that leads into other things i want to talk about Digression very quickly, just the nature of language and the power games of language. We will talk about post -modernism, that postmodernism for so long on stuff. another episode. Fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Don't use certain words because they're magical. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> so to just quickly finish out this idea here of, of gun control being the initial thought point that we're bringing up to have this discussion today, mm -hmm. the thing that I wanted to say that you brought up earlier, which made me think about things and I kind of digressed a little bit, is the nature of self protection. So we've been talking last few minutes yes. about. The nature of sovereignty and becoming a real sovereign individual and what age does that happen and can you legislate that or what are the factors that play into that we didn't even jump into the psychology or the biology or anything because that's not what i really think we want to talk about today right. we can do that another time for sure i'd love to yeah but the, the question of sovereignty and when you become sovereign is huge to me and protecting oneself is huge to me which is why i'm such an avid gun owner and uh and i always um, I guess I would lean more right in that sense that I'm I'm more about protecting the Second Amendment, more about giving people the opportunity to use firearms as cheap as possible, because I think that all people should arm themselves. And that's just my personal... Unless you have, like, mental health right, disorders sure. and stuff like that. And so how do you legislate that? Well, they're trying, and we're yeah. yelling at them for it, so right. maybe we're just biting our tongues again. Yes. But, there's, but it's complicated. It's not that black and white. But I feel personally, though, that in a world in which people are left alone to their own devices versus people that are completely legislated against and, can, and controlled and micromanaged in every way. The first world that I talked about is the better world all across the board, not even just with gun control. I'll give the gun control example first, which is if every person had a firearm, including the crazy people, and the people who did have firearms were trained and comfortable with those firearms from a young age, mm -hmm. then... Every person, like, I believe personally that the rate of mass shootings would just plummet. Well, there's less crazy people than there are, you know, averagely sane people. Right. And I feel, I feel like there's a few instances in which that might be incorrect, especially if you're in a crowded place and one guy or a group or of guys. Yeah. And a group of guys maybe open fire in, in, uh, 
highly populated, densely populated zone, maybe there will be so much chaos, everyone will have guns, but no one will know who's starting the shooting, no one will know who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. So at that point, everyone would just kind of be shooting everyone in this like mass suicide, accidental massacre. Yes. But I feel like almost as if if people were trained from a young age, and this is an ideal of mine, this is just the but ideal But there's some world. data to substantiate that. I mean, like over 90% of mass shootings happen in gun-free zones. Exactly. And that's obviously, it's the same reason why you and I don't necessarily want to place our guns on a public registry because people will target people that they know are weak. Right. People, bullies in school, young children, bully those children who they think they can get away with bullying. Or, or even like a, like a, you know, like a sexual predator mm -hmm. or a murderer. They're going to do the prey same on thing. people who know, who don't even know that people like them exist. It's very rare that someone takes pleasure in the challenge of fighting or damaging or taking advantage of someone who has the potential of besting them. Right. It's very rare. Usually they want those nasty human beings yeah. want to go after the weak. Right. They just prey on the weak. That's what happens, it, especially in bad business. If you want a challenge, you become a UFC fighter, not a bully. Right. That's just the way it works. You, right. yeah, you're looking, you become like the best samurai in town, and you, you want to find a samurai that can defeat you in combat, so you travel the world, and you do it in the proper mode. You're not going to go into some random fishing village and, and like slaughter all of the young boys because they won't pose a challenge to you. That's very rare, in right. my opinion. But Ash Ketchum doesn't go around in level two grass looking for yeah all day long yeah. <laughs> beating up the little kids and yeah. stealing their Pokemon balls. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Except in those games, it's a bad analogy because like literally the Pokemon balls are soul bound to you. Are like, they? Oh, yeah, that's like you, right. You, that's you can right. trade, but yeah. you can't steal from someone. That's true. And you can't capture a Pokemon that's already been captured. You can still just kill their Pokemon. No, I mean you can. Minor you can make them faint. Yeah. You can't kill anything in Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, you can cause, give a minor inconvenience. Now they have to go to the doctor and yeah. That's yeah. the definition of kid gloves. Right. Which, but it makes sense. It's a kid game. But that, I think, is where we're getting in society. Again, to bring up Baudrillard and the simulacra and simulation, it's that we're so lost within this matrix simulation all around us that we've forgotten that the jungle is real. And we've replaced it with a symbolic concrete jungle. And we've forgotten that we can actually really get hurt. We got right. helmets and safety precautions and all the goodness all the medicine. We just want to make everybody bubble boy. Right. Shout outs to that movie with Jim Carrey. Right. Um, well, we've escaped the food chain, but we haven't escaped the threat of each other. Right. And and human beings are arguably the most dangerous exactly. creatures on planet Earth. And we, have, we, we have weapons, intellect, intellect thumbs. Right. We have all sorts of crazy stuff. We have tools to our advantage. So, but yeah, the point memes. is, yeah, memes, <laughs> memes, psychological, yeah, very warfare. much memes. So the point, though, is we if everyone in my ideal world were to be armed and trained, although there are some counter arguments against it, um, it there would be a, a huge decrease in in gun violence because people, those bullies out there, wouldn't actually be going out and damaging the people in the public. The other argument to that that I've heard once is, oh, would you give grenades to everybody? Would you give a grenade or an RPG to every single person? And it's like. And I only bring this up because it's an argument I've heard multiple times as people try to make these equivalencies between mm -hmm. grenades and firearms. Right. When you got a pew pew gun, it shoots straight in straight lines. Right. A grenade goes boom and kills like 30 people at once. Right. So but a shotgun can do that too. It can, and it, but at the same time, I, I don't feel like they're great equivalences to talk about because it, if everyone's armed with grenades and one guy throws a grenade in public and blows up a bunch of people and then all of the people are armed with grenades, for one, it's going to create a domino effect of explosions yes. and everyone will die until the city is burned to nothingness. But two, let's say that grenades only exploded when they were thrown or something right. like that. Then the people lobbing grenades back at the enemy could potentially damage themselves and others. Right. Whereas the, the degree in which a trained person using a firearm has a much greater chance of successfully deleting that threat and and knocking it down and de-escalating the situation very quickly right. than a person throwing a grenade without hurting other people or themselves. Right. Especially if you're trained with a firearm. So it's not a great equivalent. Right. You know what I mean? If someone pulls up a gun and starts shooting in public and someone else is trained, it takes one bullet to stop that person in a quick, decisive moment. And especially if that other, other gunman was trained, you're not damaging that many people. So it's not a great equivalent, in my opinion. That's definitely interesting. I, if, if I... If I trusted an external entity to be non-biased enough to do an objective and comprehensive analysis on a person's psyche and mental state, I would say, okay, yeah, let's go for it. Sure. The problem is, is I don't see that happening in any institution. I mean, look at like, you know, big tech censorship. I mean, they clearly 
have their biases and it comes and it comes into fruition in what they choose to censor and what they choose not to censor. Yeah. Any group that is given that kind of power that can literally decide who can and who can't be armed. Sure. The group is made up of individuals and there's going to be some individuals in that group who have a bias and therefore it's going to manifest in the in the organization as a whole. Right. So I I li- I mean I I agree with what you're saying, but a part of me wants to believe that Somehow we could the same way that the U.S. government was put together with checks and balances, we could create an entity that could do it in an objective way. So but, there's only a few ways that I can think of that that can be done properly and in a way in which it can't be taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. One is everyone get armed. Yeah. Literally in my ideal world, everybody is armed and trained from a young age, so that even if something bad were to happen, somebody can stop it on the street because everyone is armed. What if you've proven that's Idaho? What bro. if you've proven that you? are irresponsible with your weapon in the past. I mean that's that's another question and that that I mean that's a different level of how to stop it in general because that that sort of go, goes into the minutia of more legislation right. like rather than how can we as a blanket solve the problem of government interference. But to answer the question, I don't know, there could be ways in which you could redeem yourself, you know, psych evaluations for one if especially if you were violent before or um I don't know, maybe serving time in the military and like achieving status and and doing things like that or public service or maybe even like there's different things that you could do to uh, appeal to that authority or to, I guess, rectify your wrongs in the past. And, And it depends. It depends on the egregiousness of the crime and things like that. I mean, legislation can be written well. Policy can be written well. Sometimes your gun rights might be revoked forever. I think that I think that the degree in which the crime that or the negative thing that you did will lead such to you getting your gun rights revoked forever would also be such that you basically go to prison for life. Like yeah. if you were to kill someone, your gun rights get revoked and you go to prison hand in hand. Right. You know, it's the same thing. But that's that's a pretty deep into the into yeah, the weeds. I also don't know if I think that everybody has the capacity to to wield the gun no, responsibly that's true. That's as true. a mind state. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been reading this book called Ordinary Men, which postul- which is studies um, the archives of officers in the Nazi party mm-hmm. in the Third Reich. And a lot of them, like at first, didn't like didn't what they were doing. They had to get them drunk. Yeah. You know, and they would purposely miss the person that they were told to shoot at. <laughs> it's and crazy. They would purposely run slow so they didn't catch him because it was they knew what they were doing was so awful. Wow. But, but by the end of it, they some of those same people were thrilled to be doing it. So it yeah, makes me like wonder awful. if like and maybe that's a slippery slope. It could be fallacy. a slippery slope fallacy, but it's good to bring up. I mean, we're just kind of rolling these ideas yeah. around. But right? if you give just someone a gun and maybe at first they're like, oh, I don't really need it, mm-hmm. but then they realize the power that it wields. Right. Could they run amok with it? So I mean, that's just another example of how complicated life and reality is in trying right. to control people's behaviors and decisions. Because my again, my ideal society would be sort of everyone get armed up but you bring up good points not everyone should be armed but then again it's like everyone can police everyone else right Right. every like every person who's armed will police those people which i like better than external entities who have a bias doing it or that have power over you right you have the sovereignty to protect yourself right if you in a in a social contract like that are worried about dying by someone shooting you you get trained and carry a gun Mm. it's very anarchistic in that way like you have to take care of yourself you have to go out and plow your own field so to speak sow your own seeds and grow your own plants and feed yourself rather than going to the supermarket. And I think that's an that's an archetype that's that is permeating every facet of our society right now is that we are all going to these external forms for our safety, right. for our food, for our energy, for and and that's just the nature of a of a society that is so technologically advanced and it's beautiful. We get more leisure time because we don't have to work so hard. We get to do this thing and that thing. I don't have to actually build the house that I live in because we have this thing called like currency even though it's that's a whole other discussion. But it, that whole idea of of externally exporting and outsourcing the work and the protective force and everything like that, such that we might be the most specialized that we can be rather right. th- rather than being like as generalized as we can be, mm. is is conducive to a great society being erected and it's obvious all around us. Look at the amazing architecture sure. and all this stuff. But but it's also it's also bleeding into the firearm conversation. It's bleeding into how can we protect ourselves? Should we do it ourselves? Should we be responsible enough? Are we responsible enough? Are we adult enough? Or should we like just have a police state out there that polices us instead of us policing the police while we also police ourselves or there's no police and we just go co- totally anarchistic and we police our- ourselves only these are large philosophical questions well you bring questions. up a good point we we're surrounded by this golden era of human history mm-hmm. where suffering is at an all-time low poverty rates at an all-time low 
you know, death by war, death by gun is at an all time low yeah. in retrospect to how many guns exist. Um, so, so to a certain degree, maybe we should give people that trust and, and, and at least do it as a social experiment. Cause, cause you know, you have to wonder how far does it reach because right. eventually those outside entities are going to enforce how you should think. Or if you can't, if right. they don't think that you're thinking mm -hmm. the right way, they can they can just come they can and get involved impose you, their will upon you like and become tyrannical like times came out with an article recently that basically said that these they literally used the word elite cabal but mm. these elitists in business industries of all different sorts and in politics legally you know not mm. conspiratorially in a malevolent way but legally changed the rules so it, to ensure, and I quote verbatim, a proper outcome in the election. Hmm. And they were trying to defend those people. The whole article was them trying to defend the elitists who went out of their way to legally change the rules to ensure what they thought was the proper outcome. So you have to wonder, wow. like, can, can it be brought to that extent? And I, think, wow. and I think that is a good example of how it can be. Yeah, that's a whole other discussion for sure. Oh my goodness. Well, for one, I, I'll we'll find the article and we'll post it up for everyone. Yeah, yeah. But it's a real article. I'm not making it up. <clears throat> I want to know who these elitists are for one, and because I mean, if it's obvious that like legislation was being changed, policies were being changed to favor one side or the other, and you can see very specifically what that purpose was, and that's what the article is about. I'm very curious to read it. Um, I also want some names, but we probably won't get any names. Right. And I, 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 once but, again, I don't. This isn't about like Trump versus. Well, it's not or, about Trump versus Biden uh, either. This is about. I don't believe that people in power should be able to ensure a proper outcome. Whatever right. that means. What does that mean? Yeah. So that goes back to the initial question earlier, and also the, just like the, the whole question of sovereignty that we always talk about. What does right. it mean to be a wholly actualized, individuated person? To give the union depth psychological jargon. Yes. Um, which we'll talk about a lot more for sure so back to gun control though but yeah i mean but i mean i like that i mean th that's a really cool article that you bring up about the nature of this external force feeling as if the average person isn't responsible enough to take care of themselves exactly. or if not responsible enough intelligent enough yes or or wise enough or whatever enough affluent enough to make decisions for their own well-being such that they put themselves on this pedestal because they're educated or they're they're yes. rich with all the money and resources and they they see humanity as as this threat, not only to themselves, but to them. And this sort of us versus them mind state is a problem because educate people, work with people, make society better instead of this, 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 and this. But I don't want to go on a, on a, I'm like holier than now sort of, you know, like flag waving speech where I can tell you that I have all the answers to stop all the problems of the world. It's just something that I see that irks me often, especially when you start thinking about this idea. I'll bring up an example. So behind me uh, in the shelf is a book called Morals and Dogma. Morals and Dogma was a book written by a Freemason by the name of Albert Pike. Mm -hmm. And it basically was for a long period of time, the Freemasonic Bible to, to say uh, the word. Isn't he the one that caused Freemasonry to like split in two? Not necessarily caused, but it definitely did. There is a split, but they're not like at war with each other or yeah. anything like that. It, they're called the right. So there's the York right and the Scottish right. Mm -hmm. Not to get too deep into the weeds of things. They're just different avenues by which the Masons can come to different uh, understandings of their own philosophy. Depending on what they value. Yeah, like the York right's more mil militant and militia-like and there's more like, it's more about like history and things like that. And um, the Scottish Rite is more about like the poetry of it, the mystical, the, the, the mystical philosophical aspects of things. Yes. But the point that I bring up is um, the Freemasons have this concept of the blind force. Mm. If anybody's seen a Freemasonic symbol, sorry to be a Cowan here and give the symbols to everyone, but this is pretty much public knowledge. The, the symbol of the compass and the ruler and the G in there and then the hammer is a symbol that they call the blind force. Mm -hmm. And it's the blind force because it's akin to like thinking of all of humanity across all of time from the beginning to the end of time personified as an energy field or mm -hmm. like this large thing. It's like a wave of energy. Think about your whole life from the moment you were born to the moment you, you die. Everything that goes on, all of your mental thoughts, all of the like atoms and reality that you're pushing around, all like all of the... Uh, food that you eat and turn into yourself, all of the art you make that affects everyone else in the world. Literally, throughout your whole entire experience of life, there's so much going on, and it's a ball of energy across a timeline that is just completely powerful. And if you think of all human beings all at once in this giant soup of super energized Earth hyperspace in multidimensional reality, 
all of that energy is just this wave, this like, it's like the sun. It's like this uncontrollable nuclear force that's just so big in these ethereal realms, right? And it's called the blind force because it's unaware of itself collectively. Mm, like right. you as an individual may have some individual awareness of yourself, but on the collective, it's it's asleep to its own self. Right. It's very much like the union collective unconscious. Right. But they call it the blind force because it's blind. And or they, like the idea of reincarnation. Yeah, like you know, mm, sort of. Without the reincarnating, like you're, we're all like manifesting as like different. We're like a hive mind. Right. But you're not aware of the hive mind. You're just aware of your facet. E of exactly. It. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that hive mind, it, we give it like real, like realness. We reify it, and it, we just call it the force, like the blind force. Right. And the the masons they give an example of like a steam engine in which. If all of the doors are shut and the coal is in the engine house and it's burning hot, by closing all the doors and shutting the shafts, you can limit the energy flow from that heat and that steam. And as it, as you like limit it and yoke it, it it creates force which can then be utilized for actual purposes such as moving the wheels and the spokes on that train to move it forward on the tracks. Right. But the moment that you open up all of the windows and you open up the vats to the to the engine, the train will break down and stop because your your energy is no longer being yoked. It's wasted energy. It's just gone to the wind. It's like an open flame. Instead of being utilized for a force, it's just destroying everything, wasting all of the resources, and nothing's being accomplished, and the train isn't going anywhere. Very expensive right. to all parties involved. Right, right. Is especially the people who aren't going to get their stuff anymore because the train isn't going anywhere. So that concept is the blind force, and it needs to be yoked. It, according to the Freemasons, they feel in their philosophy, at least Albert Pike did uh, back in the 19th century when, when Morals and Dogma was written, that the Mason had like an actual responsibility to control people at large because the Masons, with their ruler giving them the literal rule and the compass, which is a, <clears throat> the ruler, which is literal rule or the compass, which is like a high level mathematical device, which allows you to make precision circles. In and, other words, and other it's the, the rules guide people. The rule and the compass together guide the hammer, which is the blind force of the people, such that the carvings, the etchings and the markings can be made on the what's called the rough ashlar right. which it's a it's a metaphor of human beings being this rough uncut gemstone and using the intellect and the will and the moral the moral justice and being a rightly minded individual with your own powers sure. you can shape yourself from the rough to the perfect ashlar to the right dimensions the right cubic dimensions of being like this perfect cut gem that can be fit well that other fit gems can be placed next to you such that this amazing device can be built or a temple like because you can think of yourself as like a like a brick in a temple or something yeah, yeah. and all of these people who are becoming better becoming freemasons are making a wor the world around them more uniform and more beautiful and more morally just through the symbolism of all of these things and by controlling that blind force, they can also help shape the uninitiated. They, they call them babes. Like, we, we Masons are men who can sustain ourselves off of yeah. meat and bread. And these babes, the, these masses of people who are extremely dangerous to themselves because they're all magical beings, but they have no idea about that. We need to control them. They need milk. Right, it's very Nietzsche and it's very mm -hmm. Ubermensch. Yeah, very yeah. much like the Ubermensch. But right. th those babies need milk for sustenance so we will give them that milk and we will be over here eating our meat and bread and it's a very elitist mindset and i used to hate that mindset i know this is a long digression just to get to that point but i used to think about the world in those general terms like oh these super elites out here controlling everybody and playing all the moves and hard limiting people's freedoms and controlling everyone and mind control and memes and all the stuff and like the more that I study some occult philosophy, sometimes the more that I actually am apologetic for and side with these sort of elite groups, because it's crazy. Like imagine how hard it is for one to control yourself right. as a human being. Like if you have a porn addiction, it's going to be really hard for you to not go beat off to porn the moment right. you see a girl walk down the street. Right. If you have a food addiction and you go out to a restaurant, it's going to be really hard not to eat. 
or ice cream or whatever, if you have an addiction to drugs and there's heroin right in front of you, even small things like you smoke cigarettes and you want to quit and you can't. And you or, get a whiff of it. And... Yeah, or even the smallest things like you wake up in the morning and tell yourself, I'm going to get up early tomorrow morning because I have a lot I want to get done. And you slap the snooze button on your alarm like seven times. Right. And you're in that habit. And you're like, man, I wish that I didn't do that. But then the very next day you're going to do that. Even something small like that, how hard it is to change your own habits and break those spells, how even harder it is to change the behaviors of people around you that you love, namely your children. Even my one-year-old child is impossible to control. Right. For one, he has no language. But two, even the like three, four, five. Well, and then and then before and before we even step up all the way to like an elite person looking down on an entire nation, think about like I've worked a lot in managerial positions where you know if you read a lot of the the literature on that. It's not so much shaping the people, but it's about creating an environment where the people will prosper. So just doing that in a, in a, in a sprint store is hard, you know? Imagine doing that for an entire nation of people. Yeah, exactly that point. Exactly. Yeah, it's like trying to do it for any number of people aside from even just yourself or your small circle is almost uh, impossible to even fathom because of how difficult it is right exactly and so i'm a little bit more apologetic for these control systems trying to hard limit things trying well, you, to a part of you wants to find me too wants to believe that if you had become actualized to the mm -hmm. point where you realize that yes everybody is this magical being a part of this hive mind that you would have the wherewithal and the and the insight and the intuitiveness to not overreach you know, right. not to, not to just, just, just to create, like I said, create the environment without mm -hmm. p putting a, a grip on the necks of the people. That seems like that would be the best way to be for right. sure. But how you do that in reality is so difficult. And where that proverbial line is crossed is hard to, yeah, in, hard to detail. For sure. And we should talk about it more and more and more on this channel as we are, you know, slowly making our way towards that, that point across the episodes. Uh, in which we're talking about politically oriented ideas. Right. And, the but... and, and the Dow talks about, you know, a government who kind of lets things g g flow freely creates happy people. But, it, but uh, a government that's kind of like a like a nosy parent mm -hmm. creates disharmony. So, so thank you so much for bringing that up because I would have forgotten. But earlier when we were talking, I was giving a few examples. I, we started with the gun control thing, but I wanted to also say that it's about control at all. Trying mm -hmm. to control your life at all tends right. to end up in, in these weird neurotic tendencies where if you have a micromanaging boss at work, it makes your life hell and you want to quit because right. you're like, hell no, let me do my job well. If I'm doing my job poorly, then please, by all means, reprimand me. But if I'm trying to do the job well and you're like breathing down my neck, it makes it extremely difficult for me to do my job and to be happy to do my job. Right. And I feel like that's, and that's what I meant earlier by that's an archetype across life. When you're trying to control your children's experiences, if you don't do it holistically, you're just like, oh, don't do that thing. They're going to go do it. And they're going to do it and get hurt because just because you told them not to, you didn't work with them. You didn't like foster that environment that you're talking about right. to allow them to go experience these things safely and potentially get hurt. But on your watch to a level in which like it's OK if they kind of get hurt. And that sort of that sort of entire way of thinking like helicopter parent versus the right way to parent can or the right way to be a boss. Yeah, it brings it. We were talking goes, about that earlier. And it kind of yeah. blends in with the and I wanted to give the gun control exp uh, example first, but that was where it was going. Right. It's more so about the control the the entire idea behind control systems. And so well, I think I know why the increased amount of control causes more disharmony in a society is because when it starts to get to a point where it's rules for thee and not for me or rules mm. for me and not for thee me is going to start to wonder why V is more competent. Why, why are sure. they able to, to make these decisions, mm -hmm. but I can't when I feel like I'm this fully individuated, yeah. fully actualized person. When you may or may not be, you might right. be completely ignorant and completely neurotic and thinking you're the shit and really right. you're like, like I'm a king, but really it's like you work at the gas station and you smoke crack and you're calling yourself so a you king. So you embolden those people kind of by, by putting that extra grip on them because they think, oh, like I don't, who are these people to put a grip on me? And I'm just, I'm right. just going to rebel even more against them mm -hmm. because... And it happens, and, and it definitely happens. I think that's definitely one really good example that you give for why control breaks down. Mm -hmm. But also, I think control breaks down for other reasons such... You and I kind of touched on it in other episodes in which society is just too complicated yes. for any one like, gr small group to say that they understand for all people what the best mode of action is. And so rather than letting people or language or the whole Jordan Peterson, const you know, controversy with the language thing rather than letting it be organic and just happening and letting yes. the people decide like oh 
we've decided organically as people, you can't say the N-word, neither can I because we're white. And that's just something that happened organically rather than legislating that and trying to legislate every single thing uh, that you think is wrong. You just let it happen organically. That's like the best way to be, like you're saying, right. like the Tao, let it be free instead of trying to control it. What's well, the Romeo and Juliet problem? It's people mm-hmm. also, it's also the Adam and Eve problem. You right. tell someone not to do something and for whatever reason, psychologically, we have this inclination <laughs> to say, well, what? What will happen if I do Don't it? push that button. Yeah. Don't push that button. Right. DD, get out of my, la- you get out a, of my laboratory. If you, put a, <laughs> if you put a box in a room full of just a random group of people and said, and said, hey, I'm going to leave for an hour, but it's really important that you don't look at that in that box. <laughs> that box is getting open, man. Probably getting open, yeah. You just put that temptation out there. Right. And I mean, that's a huge, huge conversation that we could always have right. is the nature of desire and temptation. There's a great book by Mortimer Adler called Desires. Uh, it's like uh, the morality of right and wrong or something like that, or the morality of desire. But, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said here. There's so much. Well, and and it, the other thing I was going to say about it and approach it from this level is it kind of brings us back earlier to what we were saying about parenthood, about how, you know, if you've gone through this adversity that made you this actualized, individuated person, your, your goal shouldn't be to protect your kid from that mm-hmm. because that is what made right. them. But And then so you have to you wonder, have to like, them. when when you cross that proverbial line of too much control – is that their intention? They don't want mm-hmm. us to go through the what they know from history right. to cause. It's like they're. It's like coddling. Fight. It's like, oh, I don't want you to feel this pain so badly, or I want to give you a life that's. So there's two things I want to say here, really quick, and uh, on this exact point. One, you brought up earlier how we inherited things from our parents, right? And that kind of like made us a little bit more complacent. Yes. As as our generation as millennials. Right. I'm not. Right? I'm not shitting on millennials. It's just. It's just the. Fa- no, tr- objective reality. Tr- truly, and then that whole that whole concept of of like whether or not we can actually protect ourselves because they're wanting to just keep us away from pain. Mm. There's so there's two things. It's it's like two ends of the extreme. It's fear of pain and extreme love and like givingness, right? It's like you got to find a balance because two things happen. You're afraid of pain so bad that you keep your child from getting hurt or keep your society from hurting itself such that they never gain the ability to become real, actually individuated men and women to be real, wholly actuated individuals. So then they just they they always need your milk. They always need yeah, that Yeah, I was going to say, it's the Oedipal problem. It's like, I'll give you everything you need, but you can never leave and you can never deviate mm-hmm. from the law. Right, but that's like slavery too. Right. So that's like a whole, that's like a third option over here is like, but I'll, I'll benchmark that r- right. real fast. Um, or bookmark it, but the whole idea of like the, we inherited things. I I was thinking a lot about the nature of why we are the way we are as young as millennials on the op, like near the end of the spectrum of millennialism, because um, I think the cutoff is like 1995. Yeah, and so we're really close to that cutoff. Yeah, but still millennials, woo, best generation. Maybe we'll Maybe. see how it we'll all see how works it out. Transpires, but um, but I was thinking about it a lot, and I was having a discussion with a Gen Xer on their life, and it just made a lot of sense and click. So I'm gonna give the story real quick, quick digression. Hopefully it's not too long. I know I do this a lot, mm-hmm. but there's a point here. What happens was in the past when credit cards were never really existing, the Greatest Generation, as they were called before the Great Depression or right after the Great Depression, had to work for everything and they saved every penny. Mm. They worked hella hard for everything they had and they saved everything. Loans from the bank were not as as large. Um, it was sort of like a cultural societal contract that everything that you get, you get by your own two hands because we were still sort of transitioning from that era in which you had to work for everything, pl- plow your own field, yoke your own ox, go to your go to the marketplace, do your own trading, right. you know, do all the stuff yourself in order to survive and keep your family alive to this sort of like hyper specialized social uh, sort of construct in which there's so much abundance all around us and our, our system of money and currency sort of just like blew up in our faces or before that happened, it was like going all hunky dory. So everybody was able to sort of specialize like Plato in his in his ideal society. Yes. And it all blew up. Long story short, it all blew up. The greatest generation alive worked super hard for everything, but then their children didn't have a lot because of the Great Depression. Right. And so as their children sort of grew up not having a whole lot of things, that was around the time when Woodstock was happening, super hippy dippy lifestyle, everybody loved everybody, dissolving social boundaries and cultural boundaries like 30, 40 years later in this whole transition period. And credit cards became a real thing. Like bank loans got worse. Credit cards kind of became a real thing. People were like, let's just use the credit card and we'll pay this balance. And for f- long story short, because I could go all day on that tangent and it's going to go in different directions, like talking about the nature of money to be fake and fiat and the gold standard going away. But I want to talk about all that. What happened was these people started buying shit with credit cards a whole lot to give their children things, us, you and me, things that they never had 
because of the weird dynamic of what occurred. And then they didn't realize it that two or three generations later, all the shit that everyone's buying on credit and creating this new social contract of debt slavery that nobody's paying attention to, somebody has to pay that money back right. to, to, the, to the financial institutions. So our parents gave us everything we wanted. Everything. You, if you wanted an Xbox for Christmas, you probably got it if yep. you're a white kid in the suburbs. Even yep. if your parents were struggling, you probably got everything you wanted because credit cards, credit cards, credit cards, right. lay away, lay away, lay away, like pay it off, pay it off, pay it off, rent a center stuff. Are you about to start spitting bars right now? Yeah, yeah, buda ba, buda ba, buda ba, <laughs> nunama, nunama. And essentially, though, they, our parents ended up having to work extra, extra, extra long hours all the time to pay it back because they gave us everything we wanted in the material world and satiated every desire of ours, but they were never actually present to really guide us through life. To actually show us this is the right way to be. This is how you work. And even they themselves were caught up in these weird neurological... And, and we're not... That's not a denigration. No, it's not. It's just what happened it, on a grand scale to a lot of people, I think. Yeah. And, that, and that's just a, a generalization in one demographic, for sure. Because, of course, you've got so much... Everyone's had their own life experience that might not necessarily, like, vibe with this. Sure. But I think that the affluent, like, uh, mm. middle-aged, middle-class, white American who... Or, or like working class American and their children who are normally chastised by these echo chamber sort of like radicalists who are calling for socialism and things like that. We are the types of people that they denigrate. Mm. And what happened to us, like you and I are kind of outliers. I think we were doing pretty well for ourselves, but our peer group, not necessarily all, all the time. They're all really struggling. Everyone is struggling right now. But what I'm saying is credit cards happen. Mom and dad bought everything with their monies for on credit, gave us everything they wanted, but then it vanished from our lives in order to pay for all the stuff that they got for you that you got to play with by yourself, and you lacked that familiar sort of like structure in order to gain the tools necessary to become a wholly actuated individual. And that's another archetype. That's whether or not that happened to people grand scale in America, that's an archetype that I was trying to talk about earlier. So thanks for hanging out with me on that digression. But it's all about protecting, like you said, of hurting from themselves. Also, giving them everything without making them work for it can cause problems. Right. Huge problems that you don't necessarily even realize can cause problems. Right. And then there was a third thing that you brought up that I like benchmark. The eatable problem where it's like, I'll give you everything you need. You know, I'll give you, I'll, I'll pay pay your bills mm. and you never so, have to work so very a day in your life. Then. But, you know, yeah. you can't deviate from that which is the law in this house. In oh, my house, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, exactly that. And so when the government does it for you, I always think of this metaphor, or I guess this like allegorical image that comes to mind, where you and I, the little man, are just like traversing the desert. And to bring it back to the Nietzsche and Ubermensch, holy crap, the camel... Yes. Is, the camel <laughs> is the first step. There's a there's three steps yep. to becoming the Superman, the Ubermensch of Nietzsche, right? We'll do an episode about this. Totally. Let's do it. But you you start as the camel, which is this super crazy symbol of like being a hardworking individual, doing everything society tells you yep. to do, like being able to endure struggle and just like continue to output goodness and to put the team on your back yep. like work, a camel work, work, does. Work work. work, 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 and all for material gain, all for the physical world around you. Mm -hmm. Because when someone's on top of a camel, they're trying to do something in the physical world, go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So it's a very great symbol for that. And then you become the lion and then the baby, and then you become individuated as the Ubermensch. We're not gonna go into those other two symbols, but the camel, I bring it up because I feel, in my metaphor, we are in the desert trying to put in work. We're the camel. Right. And we're like parched for thirst. It's been forever since we've had water. And it's sort of like, rather than bringing us to the watering hole and giving us the means by which we can follow the map and follow the roads and follow the landmarks and actually do the work to pass through the, the caverns and the jagged, uh, like, stalagmite filled spider demon filled <laughs> forest with lots of dangers fire. and freaking dragons and all this stuff <laughs> like sure maybe we have to traverse through all that craziness to get to the watering hole but if i can get to the watering hole i can i can feed myself drink myself and feed my family and all will be well right right but instead it's almost as if like we have built our social construct in a way in which we require other people who are closer to the well or the watering hole to get a cup of water by people who are closer than them to the watering hole and it's this weird like uh it's like a track it, it, meet you're passing the baton yeah it's an industrial sort of well-oiled machine in which trickle down wealth is coming down the pipeline and people are are just like so thirsty and they get just enough water and whether or not it's on purpose purposeful slavery or not the debt slavery aspect of it is real we're so parched that we have no energy to walk forward five or six more steps a little bit closer to the watering hole 
Instead, we just wait for that little bit of water to get handed to us. But do you think that's us. a fair trade for all the amenities that we that's take a great advantage question. of besi- that our ancient ancestors or even just ancestors from 100 years ago didn't so take advantage of? So the question of. is, do you want to be a slave because it's comfortable right. is what that translates right. to. Because it's real slavery. Right. Like you, you are comfortable and complacent. Like if and you, you get to have here. electricity and heat mm-hmm. in your house and air conditioning and you know, your fridge is full of food – are you willing to, to sacrifice a little bit of your sovereignty for that? Right. And, and that's a huge, huge question. What does it mean to be a citizen and, and, you know, be a part of this huge, larger than you, like, order? Right. And so we talk about that a lot. But that's the metaphor I give, and that's what's happening. All of these things are conglomerating together to make this big image that we're have, that I have that we're talking about, right. which is, like, weighing that scale of, of, like, uber love, giving you everything you want such that it damages you, Uber fear, taking away everything about your sovereignty such that you have to rely on the tit and the milk. And I just like, you know, bubble boy you up and then you're safe. We need to find a middle ground in between those things to become strong individuals. And we need strong individuals at the floor of our social construct in order to build strong societies and and structures that are lasting. So that's which comes back to creating the proper environment to do so and whether or not, you know, we trust the people in power currently to do that. In a, in a way that isn't overbearing. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing that up. So now we can finally move forward. Yes. We got trapped in we got trapped in some loops there for a minute, but that was fun. It was fun yeah, for it was me. Yeah, awesome, yeah. But uh so you bring that up, right? About like to me that brings me to the second amendment, the purpose for it as it was written down by the founding fathers, which is to protect oneself from a tyrannical government. Right. Because which we some give people too much. will say that that's like a right-wing talking point, but doesn't it specifically say yeah. in the constitution mm-hmm. that it's for it literally says that. What's if, the quote, though? I couldn't read it to you exactly. We have the Constitution over there, but it's too far to, to grab. Yeah. It basically says if your government becomes tyrannical, it's not even like we suggest that you do, but it's a declarative statement, an imperative statement. You will, like, you must stop your tyrannical government. Well, and it was written by people who had literally fled just from done a, that. who had just dealt with that bullshit. Yeah. So they they kind of knew a thing or two, believe it or mm-hmm. not, even though they were old white men. And there's a lot of false equivalences or not false equivalences, but like bad arguments, straw man arguments and stuff where people are like, "Oh, they had slaves, so we should get rid of everything that they sure. say or they're old white men." Which part we of the talked patriarchy. about that in the episode of Wisdom versus Knowledge. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, exactly. Go check out that episode yeah. about whether or not we should do things because Trust of other. gurus if they deviate from what they espouse. Right, or if there's one little thing that's wrong with someone or a society, do we throw the baby out with the bathwater right. at the same time? Great episode. Go check that episode yes. out. I'm loving how we're actually hyperlinking. We, this is a, this so is a many, meta episode in so itself. So many kind of, episodes yeah. have been that way lately, which is so good. But th- that, that's the point of the Second Amendment. That's the point of having guns. But the main argument that I'm hearing these days now is, oh, our government is so powerful. And we even talk about this in, in another episode uh, where we were talking about Man, enough hyperlinking. Everybody's so tired of hyperlinking for now. (laughs) But we did talk about this in another episode. But it's like our government is so powerful now that even if we all had pew pew guns, they've got rocket launchers, they've got laser guns. Sure, but governments aren't inclined to just blow away their entire nation because Mm -hmm. then they have nobody to govern and then they have nobody to, you know, look down to. I hate to say it that so pessimistically, mm -hmm. but and so that is a good counter argument to that. To want the first counter argument to having guns to protect yourself from the government is the government's so powerful and private industry, private corporations and companies are selling weapons to entities, whether or not it's legal, in which even if we had little pew pew guns, it's not gonna be enough to stop us from a a tyrannical force like descending upon us. Guerrilla warfare is very powerful though. It is, and that's one of the reasons why China and Russia and other countries have never invaded us is because they know how many Americans are gun-toting Americans. Exactly. And fighting a war on American soil, trying to get just trying to get past the regular Joe Schmoes who've got guns on their front yard, trying to get to the location to have the war is like they they don't want that. Yeah, there's you know there's a lot of literature on how bosses are just as worried about their employees as their employees are worried about their bosses, and I mm-hmm. I, I guarantee you, you know the government isn't they're not foolish. They they probably question their own efficacy to yeah. fight the people if it came down to that situation. Yeah, and there's some good counter arguments to that, to that to that weird sentiment that people who seemingly be anti-gun have uh, saying that we can't protect ourselves. Well, for one, you have a militia who are like citizens who are just like you and me. Most of the time those military sort of styled uh, men and women are going to be more right leaning probably mm. and they're probably going to be more pro gun and they're probably going to have guns but although a lot of left leaning people have guns yes and i'm not trying to not trying to take sides here i'm just saying what what i guess i'm trying to say is you would have to convince regular joe schmoes who are 
usually compassionate, who are trained with weapons, who know the dangers of them, who respect them, to go into people's homes and actually like kill them and take advantage of them. And I guess you brought up the book Ordinary that you're reading. Men. Yeah, anybody with enough psychological encroachment and enough propaganda and enough just societal reinforcement, it's it's arrogant for you to assume that you would be the one out of a thousand person who would say, no, I'm not going to no, do that because it's wrong. So that's that would be the antithesis to what I'm trying to say, which is you would have to convince these people to go do that. But I do agree with you, especially after you reading that book and just knowing what we know about like the Nazis yeah. and Mao's China but and that's even not, our friend that's, Boone. That's a lot of variables. There's a lot of, there's a lot of variables in this whole conversation, yeah. which we hopefully people are still interested in this conversation yeah. at this point. But it's it's that you would have to you would have to convince the the military to descend upon its own people which has happened plenty of times in history so it's a little naive to say that it can't happen but it's a little bit difficult especially in today's day and age when we are all so connected yeah. and it's like i think in america there's almost a bigger chance of the people in the military and the law enforcement mm -hmm. siding with the people at least in right. little pseudo right. you know revolutions in small yeah. backwoods towns yeah, that make a, a difference weird and weird up. skirmishes and stuff yeah so two ideas come to mind from this whole thing earlier i was talking about um one way to actually control guns and i don't think i delivered on that and the other one is something that just got brought up right now so if you and both of it is automation and robotics mm -hmm. so if you don't um if you're unable to convince a militia of human beings to go do your bidding for you as this tyrannical government, just make a bunch of robots go do it. Skynet 101. Right. Just like get a bunch of Terminators to go do it. Build like robot dogs to go like destroy people. Use drones that are flown by AI and go kill people, whatever. There you go. You've got your strong guns. Your pew pews aren't going to do anything against those guys. So just send them all out. You don't even have to convince a militia to do it. You win. So that's one way. The other way of earlier that I forgot to throw it all the way back really quick is um, like bioweapons, like bioengineering weapons to like only be able to fire in certain ways or under certain conditions such that like you can potentially limit um, people like some sci fi level shit. Like maybe if we could get to a point technologically where if you're having a psychotic break, something in your brain would be firing such that like the machinery itself could detect that you were having a weird, crazy ass experience such that it would like literally not. Well, you know, allow another you one that's been postulated too, and sorry to interrupt you. No, you're good. But um, it, I, I want to say it was either like, it was like MSNBC or New York Times or something like that posted an article about efforts to basically create the minority report. Oh, where wow. they can, mm -hmm. You know, because we think about now, like the, our technology is so connected to us. Yeah. It's almost psychically connected to We're us. We're getting there at least. We're getting there. Yeah. So it's not outside of the realm of possibility that they could kind of detect your behavior and, and – Beforehand. Right, mm -hmm. and, and record it diligently enough to know when you're going to commit a crime beforehand, maybe That's days scary. in advance. That is like the minority report. It's the thought police. Right. It that's very totalitarian. The future police. That's scurry. Yeah. It's very much like the Gorgon's Eye. For anybody out there, well, I don't want to talk about it now. Just type in on Google Gorgon's Eye. It's very creepy. Very very Never creepy. Heard of it. It's a real technology that exists for surveillance. Um, yeah. So, all of those counter arguments aside, I mean, you could go back and forth all day on that. Like, oh, there are weapons that have thumbprints and things. You know, all sorts of cool things. But ultimately, I feel like us having guns is not always necessarily about protecting ourselves from a tyrannical government. It's more so about protecting ourselves from each other in lieu of right. waiting for the police to come protect right. us. And, and, and so one thing I, I want to bring up, I don't want to bring up any like hyper-partisan sure, statistics sure. or anything like that. But, um, you know, Britain got rid of their guns. Yeah. But mm -hmm. knife did. crimes went up. 200 percent 200 and 250 percent yeah so it's it's almost as though you ban knives now yeah you're gonna ban knives are you gonna ban glass objects that you could break and yeah like slice a glass bottle with? yeah exactly i mean how yeah. much can you really nerf the world before you realize that oh human some human beings have this innate proclivity to act violently yeah. and regardless of the environment you set up they're mm -hmm. gonna figure out a way to manipulate that environment or take to, advantage to, of yeah. something in that environment to to do, to do what bidding. they need to do yeah. yeah i mean you literally people kill themselves in top security prisons all the time when all they have around them is just like a, a metal of bed paper. yeah or a roll of toilet paper or something crazy like that so uh sorry about that technical difficulty we, yeah, didn't, we didn't even realize. realize we weren't recording so let's just jump back into it but um, yeah, I mean, nerfing the world is, is asinine and it's like, it's a little bit too big of a bite to chew on. I think it's just something that is impossible. Well, so. that's the whole thing with the, and sorry to keep bringing this up, but the big tech censorship thing is that Mark Zuckerberg, if you're listening to this, 
You're biting off more than you could ever possibly <laughs> chew. It's not possible to regulate. I mean, well, maybe, well, maybe it not. Is. Well, maybe with AI, yeah. it is. With AI, with uh, individuals like, couldn't yeah. do it. An individual couldn't do it, but there's such there. Maybe you know there is this crazy movement, the hyper real, Baudrillard's simulacra simulation. Right. We are conjoining with the technology around us, these smartphones, these computers, these uh, like computational devices if we absorb them into our bodies and neural link into them potentially there might be a reality that can emerge in which literally whatever we want to plug into ourselves will be the truth and the reality and we'll lose ourselves in some simulated like creation abyss of information whatever it might be yeah and uh you know then the only thing we'd have to worry about is the external world around us mm. like animals and shit but we've already kind of conquered that right so maybe if we even we erect giant walls and we all go into the matrix and we're all happily simulated maybe then the golden era would arrive but there'd still be one asshole maybe who knows <laughs> maybe new problems would emerge like right. we always say it's like you create heaven but the, in order to get there you have to create a deeper hell that juxtaposes that great heaven because all things in reality exist as a duality so Maybe you can never escape this. So maybe nerfing the whole world, even even in a crazy cool scenario, sci-fi utopia like that, is still impossible. Who knows? You know, we're not there, but one can only assume that the archetype will continue to reign supreme and right. befuddle any effort that mankind makes to create heaven on earth. But um, yeah, these are big questions, man. So yeah, I mean, with that, with, with the whole sci-fi idea, I want to bring up one thing to close the conversation sure. on gun control. So there's a Key and Peele episode. If anybody doesn't know what Key and Peele is, it's uh, it's like these two black comedians on Comedy Central who sort of like took over Dave Chappelle's slot when he left and went to Africa. Yeah. They kind of... Sketch comedy. Yeah, it's sketch comedy. They didn't bite his style necessarily. They, they definitely innovated upon it. Yeah, they're funny, um, but you know, not funny. Dave Chappelle funny. Yeah, but, but they're, they're pretty they're funny. funny. Yeah, yeah. And they did a skit in which uh, this time traveler, this time traveler, he went back in into the past into... Uh, the room in which all of the, the the white hats were, you know, all the founding fathers were getting together and signing the Declaration of Independence. And he came up in there and he was like spieling off this rhetoric about, would you still write the Second Amendment if you knew that your weapons could be fired at such a rate that you could kill 30 men in a room in a matter of a blink of an eye? Something like that. And all the founding fathers are kind of just like looking at this guy really weird. For one, he's black. And they're all white. <laughs> so that's another layer of their comedy because so much of their comedy is racially oriented. Right. But they're all looking at him funny. And then he goes, he pulls out these two like fully automatic rifles and just starts lacing up this entire room. And all the white hats are diving behind the tables and hiding. And they're just, he's just unloading on them. And then the guns and the barrels are smoking. And he's all happy and proud of himself that he came from the future to spew his extremely anti-gun rhetoric and then literally unload on this room of people thinking <laughs> that it would affect them in such a way that guns would like no longer be a problem and he puts his guns down and these white hats are all looking around each other right these wig these white wigs and then his guns disappear out of his hands because that's kind of how those oh, old yeah, cliche movies work it's like he changed the past such that the future's been affected right. so there's no automatic weapons anymore and he smiles at himself and he, he's like yeah i did it and then all of a sudden two new guns pop up in his hands and they're hyper real like supremely futuristic like sonic boom laser guns so that made it worse it made it worse they were like i want one of those because now all, all those guys saw what could be achieved and they were scribbling notes while they were hiding oh okay and then all of a sudden he goes fuck that is <laughs> and then, so funny bro. and he basically fucked it up so the whole point of that though is exactly what we're talking about that even the attempts to make things better will be riddled and befuddled and just like thrown to shit you know what i mean interesting the road to hell is paved in good intention always you know? so just think about that when you're trying to control yourself when you're trying to control others, sometimes the best thing you can do is just control yourself and lead by example. And really, that's where I think the truth in lies. That's where the answer lies. All of the Eastern religion, Western occultism, all of the like major comparative religions, it all starts within, right? Everyone, right. everyone wants to start making changes externally, make changes out there. Right. It's like, oh, my life is in shambles, but I can change the world out there by yelling at you guys on my on my high horse. Right. And it's Change like, has to start within in order to stretch beyond you. 
And some people say that's a cliche and they'll argue against it. But honestly, like if you can't stop smoking a cigarette when you want to, or if you can't stop slapping the snooze button seven times, except instead of one time when you wake up in the morning, if you can't make small changes in your life consistently all across the board, then honestly, in my opinion, we have no room to be attempting to make changes externally in the world around us because we don't even have the wisdom or the awareness to control our, or even the power of will to control ourselves. So in neurotically attempting to control anything externally, it's really just the sort of cop out, a distraction from looking at ourselves. Right. Instead of doing the hard work to become that individual, to go from the camel to the lion to the transcendent other, which is symbolized by the baby, by Nietzsche. But we'll, we'll cover this again, mm -hmm. but ultimately I just wanted to sort of close this episode with this call to action to try to better yourself before you tell someone else how to be better and yes there's room to to change the external environment no we can't be perfect no you're not going to be able to like constantly change every right. little thing about yourself and you shouldn't you shouldn't be like okay i hit this 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 and this now i can go do this it's just the underlying context the, or the motif behind it the energy right. behind it is it's just give graciousness to the world around out there because it's extremely tough to control because you yourself are extremely tough to control yourself. So just have grace and be patient and fix yourself. You know what I mean? Make your bed, clean your room. All that Jordan Peterson cliche shit is the truth. Right. The way that you would better yourself is the same way that a society should better itself. And that's through incremental change. And incremental doctrines don't have the same selling power as a revolution or a radical change. But it has been shown time again, time again throughout history to be the most efficacious way mm -hmm. to bring about... Cha good, good, powerful change, and the evidence suggests yeah. that we're the wave that we've been riding of incremental change in the last fifty years is only going to increase by a in, large. Margin. In my opinion, it's incremental change that is also predicated on empowering the individual. Yes, but empowering the individual such that you also give that individual awareness of their holistic property what that means of being a whole on in a whole archy, which mm -hmm. we talk about in other episodes, uh, in which like, yes, we're giving people power. Yes. We're teaching them to be an individual and to stand up on their own two legs. But at the very same moment, we also need to empower people and encourage people and teach them to also blend into the whole and to see themselves as a part of a whole, just as much as they know that they are an individual and together holding those two things in their mind through sort of like positive holistic cognitive dissonance they we as people can achieve better things and we don't necessarily we wouldn't need to control everyone we wouldn't need to control whether or not you 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 can have a gun it's it's i'm going to control myself and i can trust that you can control yourself because we both have the respect for each other as sovereign individuals right. in the in the very exactly. new age way exactly. very very buzzwordy new age way that like puts nasty salt in my mouth it's namaste it's I, I recognize the, the higher being in you. Yeah, there's the Om symbol. I recognize the being in you that recognizes the being in me. And that mutual respect, two adults meeting on the open field, is that coming together, that conjoining, that, that's the essence of civilization. That's the essence of the give and take of humanity, of loving on each other and trusting each other. Because a, a lot of this, like whether, again, it's the pole of love or the pole of fear, it all boils down to a lack of trust in the ability and capability of that individual to take care of themselves and you. So getting ourselves to a place in which we can give each other that trust and to trust ourselves is where we need to get, more so than trying to control the world out there. And how we do that, I don't have easy, simple answers for, right. but that is how I feel. That's the value that we need to be chasing rather than all of the symptoms that we're trying to throw Band-Aids upon is, is exactly that. So. Well, first of all, BJ, that was a really profound conversation, and I appreciate you very much. Thanks for having these discussions with me, man. Thank you, man. Much love. And, and to you guys also, we, we thank you for making it through to the end of the video, especially considering the technical difficulties. Uh, you know where to find us. We're on all social media, all streaming platforms, and we love you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks for engaging in these, in these episodes with us, and thanks for sticking with it. And, you know, we're constantly improving, and I know sometimes we can ramble, and that can be killer but for all of our diehards out there you're the best and we're only improving so thank you again with that we'd like to thank you for joining us and continue the great conversation <laughs>